as she, uh, she walks with him. So a big, huge barrier in sports, in one sport, is the two-hour mark. The two-hour barrier, and this is the barrier in the sport of marathon racing. And so the fastest, probably the best marathoner ever is this guy. His name is Ilya uh, Kipchoch, and he is the current record holder at two hours, one minute, and 39 seconds, which that's 26.2 miles in just a little bit over two hours. And so people are like, okay, let's see if we can, if we can get a human being to go under two hours in, and cover 26.2 miles in, in two hours. So it wasn't going to be an official event. They just set up the perfect conditions for him. They did it on a racetrack in Italy that was just flat and big, right? So a racetrack, you know, those Formula Ones are over a couple of miles long, and it's flat and really gentle, easy turns. And they're like, we're just going to put him on that, and we're going to do it on the perfect day when the temperature will be right, and it will give him all this great stuff, right? So, so they did it all. They give him the best trainers in the world, and they give him all the cool, fancy equipment. He does all, you know, he does all the workouts that they ascribe to him. He's got his team, his team who's going to help him along, and off he goes. And so you'll notice all the swooshes because, of course, if Nike is going to fund all this, what are they going to do? They're going to sell some shoes in the process, and he's wearing one of their shoes, and there he goes across the line and you're like okay how'd he do i can't give it away this early all right so <laughs> but but he's he's got perfect conditions on the perfect course he's he's got all these experts behind him and he has his nike shoes right which is which is again what are they trying to do they're trying they're trying to break it but they're also trying to sell some shoes in the process so it's good to take a look at him because we are in this series called running the race and you and i as disciples of jesus christ are running a race and we're walking with our lord and savior jesus christ and the scriptures describe it as running a race in the book of hebrews which is we're doing right now in our Bible study, so please, please uh, join us if you can. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God fixing our eyes on Jesus. As he lived, we lived. As he encouraged us, we encourage each other. As he led the way, as he marked out the path, that's the path that we follow. And so last week in this series, we said, okay, if, if we're going to run a race, we need a plan. When they sat down with Iliad and they said, okay, we want you to be the guy to break two hours. And they actually did a couple of other people. Um, they weren't able to do as, as well as he was in the challenge. But they gave him a plan. You're going to train this much. You're going to show up at our laboratories this much. You're going to talk to this coach. You're going to talk to this exercise physi uh, physiologist. You're going to eat this. You're going to not eat that. Now, fortunately for us, when we come to God's plan, it's much easier than all that, right? <laughs> it's simply, hey, man, you love God and you love people. You love God, you love people. And that's what we took a look at last week. And so now, this week, we get to the values then that we need to bring into the race. So we're on this race and we're on this long journey. And it's like, and it is like a marathon, right? It is 
long and you keep going. And so the values that in, you know, we want to infuse our race, you can get them, if you go on the um, Connect 15 uh, tour, you'll see this on the racks out there. On one side it says who we are, and on the other side it has the vision and the mission. So last week we went over the mission, this week the values, and I'm going to give you all five, but we're only going to look at one, one today. So the five core values of our church, the first one is space to grow. And the idea there is really, really, really simple. We are all at different seasons of life. If you looked at the worship team today, we had teens, we didn't have a 20-something, but we had teens, 30s, 40s, 50s. I won't go to the next, I, the one person's getting close to the next, I actually maybe did get to the 60s, right? Or no, that's coming up, coming up shortly. All right, so, uh, but you see all those people are in different seasons of life. From a college student to empty nester parents. And that means it's not one size fits all. There's Everybody's in a different season, so the expectations on everybody is different. I, I remember years and years ago when we first started, you know, I first started doing the pastor, and, you know, you encourage people, hey, take your faith seriously. So you'd have these, you know, you'd have these young moms, and they got two or three kids, like, under four, you know, and they're like, oh, I try to have a quiet time, but every time I have a quiet time, I fall asleep. I'm such a horrible, I'm such a horrible Christian, Help me, pastor, to be a better Christian. I'm like, next time you fall asleep, here's what I want you to do. Sleep. Because what God is telling you is the most important thing for your journey right now is this nap. So take it. And that's space to grow. That's like, hey, man, where are you in your seasonal life? For me, like, you know, one of the reasons why I give you these, you know, marathon things is, you know, I, you know, for those, if you're new to the church, you might not know that I like to do marathons, and I've done some, you know, long-distance triathlons, the Ironmans and stuff, but honestly, I don't remember my first marathon until I was an empty nester, and my kid moved out of the house, and I had more time to train, because before then, I couldn't, I can do it, right? So that's space to grow. The next one where we're going to land today is supportive community. So I'm going to go over that one quickly because um, we're coming back to it. Every member of minister, if you were here in the summer, you saw all those people from the church get up and give their member preach um, sermons, which is great. And I love that because it reminds us that it's all of us, right? But the other thing that's important to remember with this is there's not a hierarchy in the church. It's not, well, you know, I've got the education and, and I get to preach most of the time. No, everybody is necessary to make this thing work. We saw it when we did Daniel's funeral this week. I mean, just the people holding the door were so critical. So critical because people are coming through the doors of this place and they're freaked out and they're scared and they're worried and they've got, in some cases, tears running down their cheeks. And there's Shannon and there's Joanne and there's Jeff and they're welcoming in and they're telling them you're safe here. Okay? This is horrible, but you're safe here and we're going to show you what it looks like to grieve with hope. Right? That... That takes all of us. And all you people praying in the background, it takes all of us. If you prayed this week for Daniel and his family, you're, you were a minister this week. And, and you ask that family, they will tell you that your ministry was effective. So all of us do that. And then all of us serve. All right? And then finally, we do outreach in word and deed. But today, we want to take a look at supportive community. And again, if you take the uh, Connect 15 and grab one of these on your way out. But supportive community looks like this. Supportive community, like the early church, we value the gift of community that God has given us. 
We seek through God's transforming power to be a community where growth is encouraged. Healthy differences are respected. Pause. Sometimes we think like we walk through the church doors and, okay, so what's the program? I got to get in lockstep with the program. It's really not how Christianity works. In fact, if we look in the scriptures, what we see is everybody has different ideas and opinions, and that's actually good. See, in the church, the question isn't, how do I prove to you that I'm right? The question is, what do I need from you? What do you bring that I don't have? What perspective do you have that I don't know? Completely different than how like, we do things like politics, right? In politics, the argument is, who's right? It's never who's right in the church. It's always, how do I need you? What is unique and different about you that I don't even have a clue about? What do you see that I don't see? That's the church. And correction is giving in love, and the light of God shines. So that's supportive community. So, so in other words, if the plan is to love God and to love people, then a supportive community looks like what we read every time we do a wedding. We'll host a wedding. It's good to host some weddings after, you know, doing some funerals, right? We'll host a wedding next Saturday, and shocking this will be the reading, right? You all know it from, the, from weddings. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Now you've heard it a thousand times at a wedding, but recognize, Paul didn't write that for a wedding. I mean, we still use it. I'm going to use it next week. It's not bad to use it at a wedding, obviously. Paul wrote that to the church. He said, this is how you treat each other. This is what supportive community looks like in the church. All of us doing this. So I'm going to pause. You're going to open your eyes. You're going to look at it, all right? And just take it in new, right? Like that should, be a, that should be what our community looks like. So just take a look. I mean, if that's what our community looked like, right? God's love would be shining in this place. And so that's, right, that's what we want to say. This is, this is who we are. So let's go, let's go back to this idea of supportive community then, right? I, I just want to make one point before we dive into it. We talk about supportive community. It's really two communities. So you know, we started 20 plus years ago as a church plant. And there's people in the room who were part of this church when it was a church plant. When we used to put all of this in a, literally, all of this into a box, including the speakers, the monitors, roll it onto a trailer, drive it away from the schools, park it for a week, and then roll it back out the next Sunday. Set it all back up. And at that time, when we talked about, when we wrote this, when we wrote this and approved it, we were, we were that. We were a church plant trying to make our way in the schools. And when we talked about supportive community, we really meant like crossroads. We support each other because some of us, since every member is a servant, some of us are getting up early enough in the morning to unload the boxes. Some of us are getting up early enough in the morning to plug in the speakers, right? And think about children's ministry. Set up all the toys and stuff in children's ministry week in and week out. So that's what we meant by supportive community. But now, as we develop and we plant, right, and we say, right, we plant our foundation right here, we set up this building we're a supportive community in the Southline community. 
okay? We're Crossroads Community Church. So if you've ever showed up and been bumped because you're like, wait, I called Laura to get a spot at church, but there's no room for me because AA's got something going on, and then there's two other community groups going. Yeah, because we're Crossroads Community Church, and we want to be supportive of the community. Right? When, when, when there's a tragedy in the community and either the police show up or Philip's funeral home calls or, or a family calls, right? We want to be that place. That's what it means to be the light in the darkness. And it's an honor to be the light in the darkness. So we're Crossroads Community Church. So our one community is South Line. And if you, like I say, if you've been here through the whole time, that's switched. It's not just about Sunday morning anymore. And look, it couldn't be about more than that back in the day because it took all our energy to make Sunday morning happen. If you were here, you know what I'm talking about. But that's not true anymore, so we go out. All right, off my soapbox, back to the message. Okay, so supportive community. So how do we support? All right, we follow the plan, love God, love people, love is patient, love is kind, right? And then... I want to come back to our buddy here. And I want to show you why this picture is actually very, very misleading. So one, he's a Christian, okay? And when he gets across the line, he usually kneels down, and like a lot of Christians across the world, he makes the sign of the cross, okay? You know I googled Iliad Kipchoch, sign of the cross. Did an image search. Nothing. I could, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. This guy does the side of the cross at the end of his races and nobody snapped a picture of it in the entire world and put it up, right? But anyways, I digress again. Um, this is a misleading picture. That's Iliad. He's, he's crossing the finish line. And you're like, wow, that's great. Okay, so it's misleading because there were two other people who Nike tapped on the shoulder and said, you're pretty fast. We want you to try, okay? So neither one of them was close. So that's one reason why it's, it's misleading. But, but there's another one. And we're going to let him set it up. You cannot train alone and expect to run a fast time. There is a formula. 100% of me is nothing compared to 1% of the whole team. And that's teamwork. That's what I value. So not only did they take Ilya Kipchoch and put him on that Formula One track, they got 30 pacers, 30 pacers to go with him. And so the pacers would go for like three miles and then they would rotate out. Now, not only, and notice, he's in red. So they form a triangle in front of him, so they're setting the pace, and they're blocking the wind. And not only that, in front of those guys is a car with a cruise control set to the perfect time that they'll need to hit 159.59. And not only that... There's, that car is projecting a laser onto the pavement that the front guy at the head of the triangle is supposed to follow so he doesn't step once to the left, once to the right, and do it wrong. And every three miles, those people, right, people, the, the pacers, they rotate, I mean, there's new people coming in and they're keeping him going the whole time. Well, that's why it doesn't count as a world, Stacy's like, that's dishonest, they're cheating. Yeah. That's why it doesn't count for the world. <laughs> they wanted to see, could you ever get, could somebody ever get under two hours, okay? It does not qualify as the world record. 
because of because of what Stacy just said. That's not fair. You you got it. You're cheating, right? But uh, what they're trying to do, and what, and what Nike's trying to do, is sell shoes. So they need a documentary where people will watch and see how how it all works. Okay. But what I love about that is that's that's look, man. This guy is amazing. He has entered twelve marathons, all world-class marathons, like where the best of the best go. You know how many he's one of the 12? 11. He came in second on the other one. It was his second marathon that he ever ran competitively, and he came in second place. He hasn't lost since, including, including winning the Olympic gold medal. 12 marathons, 11 first place finishes. He came in second once. And on that day, the guy who beat him, the number one guy, set the world record, which held up until he came along and said, okay, you beat me, but now I need to beat your record. Sorry. <laughs> All right. But, but that's what it takes, right? He's not doing it on his own. He's not. It's all those people and it's, and it's the scientists who put together the car and the laser and the clock right in front. And that clock let them know how, where they were. Like, you're just off, you're a second off. You're a second too fast. You're se- so, so, so here, okay, so here's the point today. Supportive community, follow the plan, and you've got to get some pacers in your life. You've got to get some pacers. You got to get some people who are going to run alongside you. And now here's the thing about pacers, okay? We think that pacers are to keep you going fast, right? Yes, and they're to keep you from going too fast. Because if you go too fast, you just burn your legs right out. And you cannot finish. I'll give you, okay, so you know when I'm on vacation, you know, our buddy Pastor Dave is all, you know, up here a lot of times, and he always likes to throw something in about me when I'm on vacation, and then when I come back, he's like, with that sly smile on his face, he'll say, so, did you listen to the message yet? And then, (laughs) which will force me to go to the website and listen to the message so I can hear the joke he cracked about, but he's going to totally help, but he's on vacation, he's down you know, he runs our counseling center, and he's learning more about counseling right now. He's finishing up a course in Cincinnati. So, I, so I'm talking about him today. All right, so, so we are doing, in our community, supportive community. We support faith, um, uh, faith in action in town, right? Or active faith in town. We do support faith in action too, but active faith in town. And active faith was doing a walk to, to uh, raise money for their food pantry. And so it's called the crop walk, and we do, we do the crop walk. And it's just like, I want to say it was three miles, maybe four miles. And you just go around town, and you're raising awareness for hunger, and you're, you're getting some funds together, and that keeps things going. So, so it's Dave and I and a bunch of you from church, and we're over there at Active Faith. And, and, and Dave, we're standing there, we're doing our prayer before we go out into the community. And after the prayer, you know, Dave comes up to me, and he says, hey, you want to run it? Now, it's called the crop walk, but I'm like, yeah, you know, because I run and I've been training. I'm like, sure, you know, let's run it. So he really meant, do you want to run it? So, like, I start off at my normal, like, training pace, and he just takes off. Okay, so now I'm like, I'm just laughing inside because I'm like, this cannot last, and I know this cannot last, but I'm just thinking, like, okay, he, he's not a runner. He, he does not quite sure what he's doing, so I'm just, I'm just going to play along, right? So I'm running with him, and he's like, and then he's really starting to breathe really, really heavy. He's doing, like, a 100-meter dash pace, and he's going to try to run three to four miles, okay? And he's just, and, you know, right before I was going to have to call for the crash cart to bring him back, <laughs> I'm like, Dave, man, how, how long are you plan on keeping this up? He goes, oh, we got to go four miles. I'm like, Dave, nobody runs four miles this fast. They don't? Well, how about you slow down and let me, I'll, I'll set the pace. I'll show you how to do a pace, okay? 
And then after his, you know, heartbeat got into a normal range, an aerobic range, right? But a normal pace range. And we ran for a little while. He goes, oh, so this is running. <laughs> That's why I always hated it, right? <laughs> because, you know, he'd go, I'm going to go out and run. And he'd run 100 yards really fast. Like, well, that's the stupidest thing. Why, why, how could anybody do that for 26.2 miles? The answer is they can't do it for 26.2 miles. Nobody does that for 26.2 miles. Nobody. And in your race with Jesus Christ, I see it all the time, the person who wants to sprint it. No, man. Get some pacers. Get some people who will go with you and have been on the journey before. This is why things like AA work so well. Because they say, hey, you know, you, if you get a sponsor who's a little bit ahead of you, and, and, and they've, they've done this before. They've walked this journey before. They, they're going to understand when you're breaking into a sprint and you need to slow down. So... So pacing is so, 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 so important. And, and the things that we have around here to pace are all, where'd it go? Well, we're, I, I brought up the, uh, Jeff, you probably picked it up. It's okay. No, no, it's all right. Um, so there's a thing. It does not look like this. It has all the groups all the life groups in it. If you go on the Connect 15, you'll get it. But notice the life groups that we went through today, okay? Um, Jeff will hold it up for you because he really does have it. <laughs> no, no. But, but it, it looks like that, okay? And, and what it is, it's all the groups at Crossroads. And notice some of these groups. Look, there's a men's group. There's a women's group. There's Bible studies. Then there's a mom's group. And I love the mom's group. The mom, you're not, if you're looking for deep theology, don't go to the mom's group. No offense to the mom's group. But if you're looking for lived theology, go to the mom's group. What do I mean by that? What the, the most important thing for people who have been talking to three-year-olds for an entire week is to talk to other adults <laughs> and to get some encouragement and to get some love and to know you're not alone. That's loving God and loving people. Now, you're not going to dive into Hebrews like we're going to do on Wednesday morning. But you're going to, that's live theology. That's, hey, we're just here to love each other and support each other. So go to mom's group. Or go to any of those groups in there. And if you say, you don't understand my work schedule. You don't understand how... I'm being driven, right? And, you know, we got people in this church who literally haven't been in church in a while because, you know, every time I talk to them, I'm still on seven days. All right, you're working seven days? Don't, don't join a life group at Crossroads because you're going to get your pace going too fast. You're working seven days. Try to listen to the messages online. Make sure you're getting a chance to pray. Remember there's people with you, Okay. That's supportive community. But we all need some pacers. So, the final thing, right? This is still a misleading picture. So how did he do? They spent millions and millions and millions of dollars to get to 159.59. Notice the time clock. <laughs> he missed it 26.2 miles he missed it by 25 seconds less than a second a mile and here's what he and here's what he said uh, right he, he offers us some encouragement which is your third thing for those of you who are taking notes to win is not important to be successful is not even important how to plan and prepare is crucial. When you plan very well and you prepare very well, then success can come, hear this, on the way. The winning can come on your way. 
the beauty of supportive community is that you get to be in community. Is that you get to be with other Christians. Is that you get to, you get to you be in the same room, in the same space, carry each other's burdens. And when it's your turn to go through tragedy, which this life will send to all of us, right? You got companions. You got people who know how to form a triangle in front of you and cut the wind. You got somebody who knows where to put the laser line so you can walk on the straight path. You got people to love you. And then if you win, okay. Doesn't matter because you've already won. You've got the greatest thing you could have in all the world, a Lord and Savior who loves you and people to go with you on that journey. One fifty nine fifty nine is not better than that. And he knows it. And that's why he can say what he said. So we want to be that supportive community. And the number one thing I want you to think about today is how would you describe your current pace? Are you our, are you our associate pastor who decides he's got to sprint for four miles and you're trying to sprint at a 100-yard dash pace for four miles? How's that working for you? Probably about as well as it worked for him. And, and, I, I, it might be your hearing aid. That sounds like a hearing aid. You got it? Okay. Um, in our culture, it's an ugly idol that we have of being busy. It's an ugly idol that we have of the, I go faster and faster than everybody. I'm going to tell you something. I check the top 10. Keeping the Sabbath is still there. They haven't taken it out yet. I know a lot of us are waiting for the day they're going to take, keep the Sabbath out of the top 10. It's not going anywhere. If the Lord rests on the seventh day, then we probably need to rest. If you read a if you read a marathon training guide, they will tell they'll say, okay, here's this here's the workouts you never skip. First one, off day. You try to run every day the lengths you need to run for a marathon, your body will break down and you will never finish the training program. And then the second most important one is the long run, right? Because obviously you got to be able to do it. But the first one you never skip is the rest day because that's what keeps you from breaking down. So how would you describe your current pace? And who are your, who are your pacers? Who's running alongside of you? And who's going to form that triangle and break the wind when you go through your difficult day? Days.